Hello friends. Today we are going to be doing a mock read aloud slash uh, characterization of something that I have not read or written, excuse me. Um, this is My Year in the Middle and this is by uh, Lila Quintero Weaver and she is a phenomenal YA young adult novel writer and uh, I'm going to read the back of the book for you guys to get an idea of what this story is about. So here we go. Sixth grader Lou Oliveira just wants to keep her head down and get along with everyone in her class. The trouble is Lou's old friends have been changing lately, acting boy crazy and making snide remarks about Lou's newfound talent for running track. Lou's secret hope for a new friend is fellow runner Belinda Gresham. But in 1970, Red Grove, Alabama, blacks and whites don't mix. As segregationist ex-governor George Wallace ramps up his campaign against the current governor, Albert Brewer, who loses, by the way. Growing tensions in the state and in the classroom mean that Lou can't stay neutral about the radical divide at school. Will Lou find the gumption to stand up for what's right and to choose the friends who do the same? So this book is pretty darn relevant right now, if I do say so myself, because I feel like in this tumultuous time, there is a tendency to not necessarily be neutral, but not want to make any waves because there feels like there are already so many waves right now, right? But to stay neutral is the same as to do nothing. As Lou finds out, she has to draw the line in the sand somewhere. Um, and that's going to be all about her story. Um, being a kid who her family grows up in Argentina, and they move to America. And so she, again, my year in the middle, she, she is... <sighs> She has a diasporic identity in that she can't be segregated into the whites or the blacks. She's always literally in the class. She'll talk about this as well. Her desk is always in the middle <laughs> row because they don't know where else to put her. So she always feels like an outsider to these issues as well as kind of that insider looking in. So it's a very interesting perspective, especially when you're talking about 1970s and Alabama. So, um, the section I'm going to read is kind of a media res or the midst of the story. It's page 50. Um, and what happened was, is Lou, as you hear in the synopsis, she is an aspiring track star, and she's actually pretty darn good. And um, she races against the boys in her really nice, you know, dress. And of course, her family, uh, was at an event for their church, you know, their Catholic family. And for those of you who don't know much about the Catholic faith, um, a lot of um, celebration happens and a lot of it is centered around food. Um, and so for her to race against the boys in her party dress, that was pretty huge deal. And her older sister, uh, I believe Marina, is her name. Her older sister is quite the um, little civil rights activist. And so she is having many perspectives. She's having her parents' perspective, like it's better to survive rather than thrive, like don't make too many waves. And then she's got her older sister, who's again, that younger generation, there's more fire in their belly, and they, you know, want to make things right. And then she has her white friends, right, who seem to have only one part of the narrative, right? And then she's got her friends of color, right? Miss Belinda, who is, you know, one of her friends who's a track star and has a different idea of all the issues that are going on. And so she has to, like I said, she has to draw a line in the sand somewhere, right? And she has to make her stance known and say, you know, once these things, these acts, you know, blatant discrimination are starting to happen to a friend, you know, what do you do then? 
right? You can't just sit back, let it happen, sit back and let it happen over and over again. And so this is all about her story. And I find this very relatable because it's a lot of people feel this way, right? Like we all wish that we could be as gung ho or morally centered as many main characters in a lot of great YA novels. But a lot of us are the Lou Oliveira who just don't know where they fall in issues sometimes. So, and how we can act, right? How we can be a part of the solution rather than the problem. So I'm just going to get right to this part. After a while, Papa, Marina, and Mrs. Sampero, please don't hate me, break the silence and get to talking about politics. Halfway in English, halfway in Spanish. The more they gab, the better I feel, because it's a lot better than icy quiet. Mrs. Semprero has loads to say about the revolution in Cuba. Papa has loads to say about dictators in Argentina. And we already know about the bee in Marina's bonnet. She is dying to keep Wallace out of office. Finally, Mama stops fuming about my running long enough to speak up. Please, hija, please, she says to Marina. People don't like foreigners to meddle. Please don't try to fix America's problems. I'm not trying to fix America's problems, says Marina. Just Alabama's, Mama says. I won't have you going around making trouble. But Mama, if people don't stand up to oppressors, how else will justice? Papa jumps in. Ladies, let's just give it a rest for now, shall we? We're all on the same side, Marina. Your mother and I worry sometimes that you might stick your neck out too far. We're not like everyone else, Mama warns. If the white people in this town got mad at the McCorkles for protesting, just imagine how they would treat us. Abigail whispers to me. What did she mean about the McCorkles? You know he went to jail, right? Sam's dad? Why? Sometimes I forget that Abigail didn't live in Red Grove or even Alabama. When these things happened, I get Marina to explain. Lots of protesters got arrested, she says, but they didn't do anything to deserve it. See, the people in power were trying to stay in power, so they made things as hard as they could on anyone speaking out. Abigail says, oh, and I get the feeling that for once in her life, the cat's got her tongue. A few miles passed before I remember that Abigail didn't get any empanadas. Mama, the empanadas were all gone by the time Abigail went through the buffet line. Mama says, don't worry, Abigail, I'll make some just for you. That's a big deal, by the way. Okay, and I'm just going to end it there. Um, and I chose that part because it's very interesting. You have many different perspectives going on. And... The characterization in this book is so great because this author, Miss Leela Quintero Reaver, does a great job of having one character representing a certain opinion or kind of being symbolic to that opinion, right? You have the dad's opinion, the mom's opinion, and um, her friend, <laughs> Miss Sembrero. Um, and I like the juxtaposition of mom and Miss Samprero, and they don't really go into Miss Samprero's uh, character a lot. But in later in the book, you will learn that there are spectrum to that generation of women, um, Argentinian women as well. Um, and we just find that Lou's mom happens to be on the more quote unquote conservative side. Um, and then you go into uh, the other generations, right? Marina's like, no, like justice, rah, 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 justice. And then we have the little generations, right? Lou, the middle school girl, and her friend Abigail, who's white. And um, them having to kind of be spectators to this. And what an interesting position that is to be in. Um, especially when you're thinking about a character like Abigail, who, you know, realizes for the first time that she th thought she had such depth and understanding to, you know things, places, and people around her, and then realizes that, you know, when she walks into a family and a culture and a language that she doesn't know, she, there's an even 
a whole plethora of side to her existence that she's not aware of because she now knows these fam this family.